Okay. I am getting older. It is harder to see. Lights do help. Woohoo! Yes. Yay. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Welcome to CR on Tuesday night. This is the place to be. Woohoo! Uh, my name is Tammy. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus, and I struggle with codependency and post abortion shame and regret. And I'm going to, can I put this up here? Okay. Oh. Hi. <laughs> I was asking you, Warren, but that's okay. Anyway, so, and I really missed Freya not being here tonight because her voice is so good that she, you can hear her. <laughs> but we tried our best without you, Freya. <laughs> uh, anyway, so the purpose of Celebrate Recovery is to allow us to become free from life's hurts, hang-ups, and habits. By working through the eight principles of recovery based on the Beatitudes, we can and will change. We will begin to experience the true peace and serenity that we have been seeking. Through this program, we will restore and develop stronger relationships with others and most importantly with God. So, if you're a newcomer tonight, yay! We're so glad you're here. We were all newcomers at one point. Um, and at least you didn't have to climb up the stairs like we did. But um, hopefully we're going to be moving back over there to the climb up the stairs pretty soon. Um, so if you are a newcomer, I want to just give you a few housekeeping things. Um, we do have an elevator. You probably won't need to use it tonight. But if you need it, it's over there to go to small groups. The bathrooms are there. There's pictures on the doors. Um, it's a no-smoking campus, so if you need to have a cigarette, the sidewalk is closest probably right out that door. Um, please silence your cell phones. And we have a literature table over there that has <coughs> Mr. Ed over here, and we have our devotionals, our step books, our Bibles, uh, Anything you'd need over there, and then we have free stuff too that goes over a variety of topics of hurts, habits, and hangups that you might identify with. Um, and the books and stuff are all sold at our cost. So, and if you really need one, let somebody know, and we can take care of that. Um, we have our special announcement girl who is not here tonight, but I do know her big announcement is. We have a women's step study starting this Sunday. Woohoo! Oh, it started last Sunday. Oh, yay! So it's still open. If you if you have ladies, if you're ready to start the steps and do the work, it starts at one. Okay, and it goes till the girls are done talking. No, <laughs> or until they have to go home. <laughs> and it's in room A one fourteen. So yes, Sundays, women's step study, and then we also have a men's step study going that is closed. So you'll have to wait if you want to start one. Anyway, um, so I actually asked, I was prepared for 10 seconds and had asked two people to come up and read tonight. So they're going to read our scriptures and steps. Woohoo! Good thing we're tall. <laughs> works for us. Um, I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. I stu or stu struggle with uh, codependency. My name is Melanie. Hi, Melanie. I'm Rebecca. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus, and I struggle with self-hatred and emotional eating. Hi, Rebecca. Hi. <laughs> One, we admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors that our lives had become unmanageable. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Romans 7, 18. Two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Philippians 2, 13. Three, we made a decision to turn our life and our will over to the care of God. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Romans 12, 1. Four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. 
Let us examine our ways and test them, and let us return to the Lord. Lamentations 340. Five, we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. James 5, 16. Six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. James 4, 10. Seven, we humbly asked him to remove all our shortcomings. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. 8. We made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Luke 6, 31. 9. We made direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Matthew 5, 23-24. 10. We continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. 11. We sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Let the word of Christ uh, dwell in you richly. Colossians 3.16. 12. Having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to others and practice these principles in all our affairs. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently, but watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Galatians 6, 1. Through God's grace, lasting change is possible. Howdy, y'all. I am Krista, and I am a grateful Christian in recovery from drugs and alcohol, and today I choose recovery. My sobriety date is November 10th of 2019 at 12.30 p.m., but who's counting? Before we get started, let's take a minute and open with prayer. Dear God, help me in this room tonight to share my story and may it touch the heart of someone in the audience or online and give them hope. Amen. I was born on March 26th of 1991 in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, to my mom, Cindy, and my dad, Carl. I have one older sister, Terry, and one younger brother, Jason. When I was younger, I remember my family being really close and happy, always going on road trips and many vacations. My mom was a believer in God, and would always go to church on Sundays with my grandparents. My mom, my sister, my brother, and myself would go, and my dad would come with us on occasion, but not all the time. He told me he believed in God, but didn't like the church we attended, so he didn't like coming anymore. After a while, he would only come on holidays, and then after a while, after that, he stopped coming at all. I grew up being a daddy's girl, my dad was a great man with many skills. Well, he still is. He worked for Gateway, the computer company, for many years. I loved doing things with my dad, like playing catch in the backyard, helping him with projects around the house, or just like in my intro pictures, there's a picture of me with a computer with a cheesy smile next to it. I built that computer. I always went to church. I always believed in God. I never missed a Sunday. I got angry with God because I thought God didn't like my dad when he stopped coming to church. I literally thought the Bible was a foreign language. I didn't understand God at all. I was a very highly excited child, loved doing stuff outside except for basketball. I missed a few practices and they put me in my first game. I got the ball and went and scored on the opposite team. The coach was screaming and I thought he was excited with me. I didn't know until later that I scored for the other team. It's, it's on the video as well. It's on my senior video as well. Unfortunate for me. I loved volleyball, sports in general. Sports were my release for many years. 
I believed I was pretty happy. When I was in fifth grade, everything seemed to change. Things between me and my dad started to change as well. I remember my emotions went all over the place. One minute I was fine and happy, and another I was not. I was upset, and there was lots of yelling. This carried on for a few months, and my parents brought me to go see a doctor, but not for a visit. I would be staying there in the Behavioral Inpatient Center. I was very upset and scared, and I did not know I was staying there until I was there. I stayed for three days, lots of tests, groups, and I came out to, and come to find out I had bipolar 1, ADHD, and ADD. I went back to school, but this time with medications for everything, including depression, anxiety, and paranoia. I had always had a lot of friends until I lost my self-esteem from all the medications, how they made me feel like a zombie, and all my weight gain. I had one friend that, held on to, that I held on to with everything. I would lash out in front of her, and she would still be my friend. Everyone else steered away from me. This carried on until high school. I, th I had two more hospital stays after that, medication adjustments. I isolated myself to, one, to only one friend or myself and everything I enjoyed. Meanwhile, my family was losing their minds. They walked on eggshells all the time around me. My mom and dad eventually stopped talking to each other. My sister ignored me. Plus, my dad lost his job and we were getting financially insecure and my mom working two jobs, and she would go out drink after her second job. At this time, I was just thinking she was working late, but later on, I found it was more than that. When I was 15, a friend of mine introduced me to weed. I was also introduced to cigarettes and drank beer for the first time. I was so much happier and bubblier, I felt like I was cool. Nothing like how the medications I took worked. It started off as a weekend thing, and I promised myself I would never do any, any hard drugs. Weed was perfectly fine. This lasted throughout high school until my junior year. I had a close friend since we were little, and she led me to believe that there were more than friendship feelings. But in the introduction to my senior year, she betrayed me by telling a lot of people that I was trying to come on to her, that I creeped her out, I went to a very small school, so when she called me out in public, it was a big deal. I felt hurt and betrayed, and I believed that God hated me because I shouldn't be liking girls. I also tore my ACL during this time, which stopped me from playing sports. Everything seemed to be falling apart. From then on, it was game on when it comes to drinking. I dropped out of high school and got to the point where I moved out of my parents' house because I wanted to drink all the time and use all the time, and I couldn't do that there. I wasn't working, and I moved into a house with a friend and her girlfriend. It was there I was introduced to meth. I masked everything I was feeling with drugs and drinking for almost two years. It's all kind of a blur in there from the age of 17 to 20-ish. Actually, hard for me to remember a lot of this, although I did get myself into an abusive relationship that I couldn't get out of. I tried ending my life at one point. My neighbor, <sighs> my neighbor brought me to the hospital. My life was unmanageable, you could say. But what I do know, that when I was 20, I ended up getting arrested for driving under the influence. And the next day I was arrested again after I got out for a large amount of marijuana in my purse and an Adderall pill in my purse as well. That was a felony because I brought my purse into the jail. I was on an intense probation program for one and a half years, which I completed. I was clean and sober most of the time, although I did drink a few times. Okay, I drank a lot, <laughs> but it was, I, I was pretty scared, so I didn't try to. Mostly, okay, hold on. In any event, during that time, I graduated with my high school diploma at 20 years old. Yes, I went back to high school, believe it or not. I finished my whole senior year in three months. I also was introduced to 12-step recovery programs during probation time, and I didn't understand how it all worked, so I went to some meetings and didn't share too much. Didn't get a sponsor because everyone was much older than I was. 
But around this time, I was more confident. I had a job, I was working, and I was still drinking on occasion, but not all the time, and no drugs. I had been living with my gran at my grandparents' house, but I moved out with someone I thought would be an okay roommate. But she was not. I ended up living in a motel shortly after, and it was around that time that I met my husband-to-be, Anthony. I met him while I was on probation. We had been best friends because we both worked at Applebee's. I had a crush on him. <laughs> I remembered when he walked through the door at the restaurant for the first time. My coworker had to slap me and tell me to close my mouth. <laughs> he said, is there a manager around? And I thought he was the sexiest thing ever. I still do. In any case, back to my story. I got pregnant. We got married and I stayed sober for a year and a half after Giovanni was born. But I was still on medications and I still suffered from emotional and mental problems. I was happy, but I wasn't. Anthony was sober and things were okay, although neither of us were very healthy. I was very up and down. Eventually came the time that we both relapsed hard. Neither of us had a program. I got pregnant again and then again. Tony and Lorenzo were born. Three times we went through cycles of sobriety and relapse. From time to time, I would try to get back to AA. As for my marriage, I would leave and go stay with my grandparents or my dad or someone I met from the program. We moved several times into really bad environments. We would be evicted and then go find somewhere else. Every time I had a baby, things would chill out for a little bit, but I was back to using meth eventually. I would drink sometimes, but mostly it was the meth. The final days of my using were awful. Anthony lost his job and was never home anymore, off doing God knows what, and I was using at home with three kids waiting to get evicted with some stranger living in our basement who always had people coming and going, all drug-related, and it was very scary. I wanted to stop, and I couldn't get out of it. I am pretty sure I overdosed during this time. I remembered waking up on the floor. During one of our fights, I ended up in a shelter with the kids, and that was my bottom. During my last year, my grandfather died during this time, and I always had the feeling that he and God were looking from heaven, encouraging me to get better, or encouraging me to go a better way. I felt like God was giving me messages. I was getting signs from God to help me during my last days that I was using after my husband got arrested I went to the shelter and I realized this was not the life I wanted and God didn't want that for me or my kids either. It was like the fear of God, but not a bad fear, a good fear. God was showing me how bad it was and how good it could be. It was terrible, but it was also a blessing because it was the beginning of a new life. Second Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, and the new is here. That brings us to the past year and a half. <clears throat> There's, or, there I was in a shelter, wondering what to do with my life. I was depressed. I had a lot of anger, and I was still emotionally very unstable because Anthony was still using, and I was in the shelter with the boys but I still made that decision that I was done and I was going to stay sober. I wanted nothing to do with it. I didn't go to AA because I had no car and it was winter. I just stayed at the shelter trying to figure out what to do. At the end of the month, I lived at the, at the shelter. I had to make a decision as to what to do next. So I moved to Florida with nothing but a suitcase full of clothes for me and the boys and I moved in with Anthony's mom and stepdad. They made sure I had no time for pity party, that's for sure. They, they kept me busy going to meetings and church and learning to take care of myself and the boys. I didn't have a free minute, and thinking back, that's probably good. We went to church at Grace Central Choose Recovery the first night we were in Florida. That night, I went to the altar, and I cried, and I cried, and I cried and Trevor prayed over me in a way that I had never felt before. 
I had never felt such an unconditional love from someone who didn't even know me. I became a part of the program for the very first time, and after that, you couldn't stop me. I started texting people and getting numbers, and well, I haven't stopped yet. I talked to Arlene about the importance of sponsorship, so on Friday, I jumped on Ashley to be my sponsor. I think she was kind of taken aback, but she did say yes. I just knew I had to take my sobriety seriously, so I had to dive into meetings. If I wanted to be different, I had to do it differently. I went to, I went to an awful lot of meetings, AA and Choose Recovery. Right now my home group is Dry Palms, the noon meeting. I tried to make it every Monday through Friday, and of course, choose recovery on Friday night. And on Monday night, I go to celebrate recovery at Cape Coral First Church in South Cape Coral. I heard at Dry Palms many meetings, many chances, few meetings, few chances, no meetings, no chances. I want a lot of chances, so I go to a lot of meetings. Bring it on. This is the first time in my life I have had true friendships that are believers in God. I have warrior sisters. I was very afraid coming to Florida because I was away from my family for the very first time ever. I had never lived anywhere other than South Dakota and I knew nobody. This was a whole new experience, but God came through. At first I was scared to work the steps as well. I was overwhelmed. It was all when COVID was hitting and my husband was in prison in South Dakota. It was all very overwhelming. But even with being overwhelmed, I just put one foot in front of the other. I had to restart my steps a time or two. It took me a while to understand what doing the steps was about. But Ashley worked with me and we got through them. I have finished going through the 12 steps first round and I know there's more to do. The hardest step for me was step five, where you tell God and another person your junk. Talking about things that happened was hard. Accepting it all was not easy. Ashley said some folks feel a weight lifted off and I felt very down and sad, reliving it all. But we got through it. Today I would describe the steps as a different way to look at my life. And seeing that I can't play the blame game I need to accept my own defects and part in what happened in my life. They helped me to stop being so selfish and I'm happier because I found a way to talk to God throughout the day. I'm never going to be lonely because I have God. So when my husband goes to bed, I can stay up and talk with God. Speaking of my husband, he's out of prison and moved to Florida too, so he's here, but he will tell his story in two weeks, so I'll leave those details to him. <laughs> the boys and I lived with Arlene and Chris for a whole year. Anthony got out of prison, and we moved to our own place. The life I have now, I am overwhelmed with joy from within, not from temporary fixes. I had to heal from the inside in order to grow outside. I am stronger in my faith than I believe in myself. This move and, the program, and my program has made me extremely close to my dad again. We talk to each other all the time. I talk to my grandma and my mom, but my sister and I still have a ways to go. My relationship with my brother is even good. A snapshot of my life today. It feels good to be accepted for who I am, and I am not judged. I have a family that will never leave me. The kids are happier. I think the sunlight has something to do with it. <laughs> but so does my sobriety, of course. <laughs> Summertime is great. Outside all the time, swimming on Christmas is so much fun. <sighs> I am happy and I am only on two medications now. That's just amazing considering all the ones that I've been on my whole life. I have a relationship with God here at Grace Church. People know me and I serve on Sundays. I don't feel out of place at all. This is like home. The service is so important to my sobriety. I am willing to sponsor anyone if they ask. I'm available. And in closing, I want you to meet someone special to me. <laughs> this is my friend, the Choose Recovery Penguin. 
<laughs> the penguin is important to me because it lives on Arlene's kitchen counter. A few months ago, in the middle of the pandemic, Choose Recovery was completed online through videos. On June 19th of 2020, Ar Arlene asked me to facilitate on one of the videos, and I had to do the part where we talked about the 12 steps. This guy played a big part in those 12 steps. The penguin and I actually did the steps together. He was sort of a pain in the neck that day. I wish we had a video of it, but that part of the video isn't on the website. The point is, it was just so much fun to enjoy doing service work in recovery. That's what's up. Maybe you had to be there to know what the penguin means to me, but he played a part in my recovery, and that's why I asked him to hang out with me up here today. Actually, he's be behaving pretty well today, which isn't like him at all. All that to say, service is important. I can't keep what I have without giving it away by making meetings, sharing, servicing at church, sponsoring, and giving this testimony. Again, the scripture that I said earlier, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. If you are new and think it can't happen for you, you're wrong. It can. Just keep coming back. It works if you work it. Thank you so much for letting me share with you tonight. So now we are going to um, have a moment of silence followed by the serenity prayer in its entirety and then we will go to our small groups and meet back here right about eight o'clock. Okay. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did, this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Amen.